Jersey. So it's a lot of protected area. Um, and we, we need that. It's, it's a contiguous forest, meaning that it's connected all the way through. There's um, crossroads, like actual roads and, um, you know, uh, like sections of towns inside of it as well. Some small areas of growth. But a lot of the Pinelands is just woods, which is uh, it's a really good habitat for birds. Birds really, some species definitely require habitats that are just constantly, you know, woods and then woods like areas with some water and other types of, uh, of habitats thrown in there, but it's gotta be contiguous woods for a couple different species. Um, wood thrush being one. Wood thrush being one of the major uh, birds that relies on that. And they have a beautiful song. Um, the thrushes are very wonderful singers. So let's see. Becky, do you want to talk about this? The, the National Pine Reserve. Lands National Reserve was, I think you already may have said it was the first National Reserve. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to show if somebody wanted to look it up under the Pinelands Commission, this is this is how you look it up. But I think you already introduced the Pinelands quite nicely. So I'll let you let you continue along, Josh. All right. Um, so along it's got you know 1.1 million acres dense forest rivers um all different kinds of uh types of ecosystems to travel through it's located um kind of in between a lot of major cities which is what made it such a prime target for construction projects in the past uh they wanted to destroy the pine lands or the pine barrens and turn it into something else uh which i'm glad they didn't but this is they, they the reference in this uh you know article being kind of close driving distance to Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Washington. Wow, it's so close to everything. Well, that means it's a really good spot for a lot of people to like come to and possibly use it for other means like a jet port or uh, all different kinds of things that were proposed inside of the Pinelands. Uh, so I'm glad that it's remaining a large tract of land that's pretty much undisturbed. It's very good that it that is uh, remains that way, right? It covers about 22% of the state so about almost a fifth, um, and it's public and private entities that control it. So I threw a picture up here uh, of a pine warbler. So the Pine Barrens Byway is kind of like a scenic display of the fact that the Pine Barrens uh, is one contiguous forest and you can travel through the entirety of the Pine Barrens uh, and see all kinds of different uh, birds and it's a wonderful location for migrating birds, especially like this guy here, the pine warbler. That's gonna be here during the winter months. Um, it can actually stay through the winter. And then into the, the summer months, they'll migrate through. Right now we are getting them in pretty big numbers. Anything to add, Becky? I was just gonna say that I, I've noticed as I drive around a lot of these Pine Barren scenic byway signs. So it'd be fun to follow the signs and see what you find. Absolutely. And there is a, an actual Pine Barrens Byway map that you could click on, you know, that you could uh, go to the Byway page and, you know, get an actual map of it. But as you drive around, I'm sure people have noticed these Byway signs before. I think I've seen them even on the parkway mm -hmm. as you travel south. Yep, I have too. Absolutely. So um, I'd like Becky to introduce this subject because she is more well-versed in it than I am. Okay, so this is the important bird areas. So this is a project of the National Audubon Society. Um, mine and Josh's Audubon group, Atlantic Audubon Society, we're just a local New Jersey chapter of National Audubon. But the important bird area is a National Audubon project. And they've chosen a number of places in New Jersey to be uh, considered important bird areas. And there's a number of them in the state. And we have um, just under 10 in, in Atlantic County included in the important bird areas. Yeah. And we're going to tell you about some of them this evening. <laughs> uh, New Jersey, Auto, uh, you know, National Audubon and, and all the other state Audubons, um, these organizations are, are strongly focused on protecting different things, you know, not only protecting birds, but protecting certain things like habitat. That's very important. If you keep the habitat safe, then you'll have the birds, uh, you know, they can, that'll migrate through and things like that. So designating these important bird areas um, 
this is a really it's a really important thing for uh, for an, or an organization like the Audubon Society to do because they have a lot of funding for research into what important areas would actually be what they would include uh, ecosystem wise it, it's very important for the important bird areas to actually have some kind of um, system for which they could be judged to say this is actually very important to be uh, protected. The Southern Pine Barrens. Um, the, the Pine Barrens extends from, what is it? It starts in even north of Burlington, in the north section of Burlington County. It travels, it travels over quite a few counties. It's an ocean, it's definitely up into Ocean County, like Northern Ocean County. It's uh, quite widespread. Um, and then it goes down into Atlanta County, and I believe it even extends into Cape May County. So it's it quite a, a large tract of land. Mm -hmm. um, and the Southern Pine Barrens is uh, obviously connected to the Northern Pine Barrens, the central areas. Um, and it, it's a very uh, strong area for migration routes, uh, birds following different migration routes uh, that we'll talk about a little bit, uh, following the, the pine barrens actually inside of the woods, like traveling inside of stretches of woods that are protected. So we have the, the southern uh, pine barrens, the northern pine barrens, uh, that includes the, um, the coastal plains, uh, which we have an inner and outer that the pine barrens lie inside of. Um, a typical pine barrens habitat would be like a, a pitch pines, and in some areas mixed with oaks, um, we have large swaths of cedar swamp, which is Atlantic white, white cedar, a very important food source for many migrating uh, warblers that rely on the tiny cedar cones um, and insects that rely on those plants as well that uh, other warblers and other uh, insect eating birds will be uh, chasing after. So, go okay, ahead. Okay, so there's also New Jersey IBBAs, which are important bird and birding areas. And this is a project that was taken on by New Jersey Audubon Society in conjunction with National Audubon Society and some other groups. Um, but if you go to the next slide, Josh, um, it tells there's a website about the important um, uh, the IBBAs and they've separated it into the regions, the Skylands, the Piedmont, the Pinelands, Atlantic Coast region, and the Delaware Bay region. So the Pinelands region and the Atlantic Coast region pertain to us in Atlantic County. So if you pop on down to the next slide, it shows some of the areas in the Atlantic Coast region, like the um, Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, which we'll talk about more, and the North Brigantine Natural Area. Um, and on the next slide, it mentions some Pinelands region locations, like the Northern Pine Barrens that we talked about, Wharton State Forest, which we'll talk about shortly. The Atlantic City Airport is, part, is located in Atlantic County, but even though it's good habitat for birds, it's not necessarily a place that people would visit. But it's good to know that we have that good habitat for birds, especially grassland species there. Another great place. Um you know, involved in this would be uh, Franklin Parker Preserve. It's a nice area to walk around. Definitely a nice uh, location. Um, and Greenwood, which is one of my uh, stomping grounds from when I was younger and still currently when I go out and bird. Uh, well, that's very nice. People want to get out of Atlantic County and go visit so Burlington County and Ocean County. There are a lot of other nice locations. Absolutely. So Wharton State Forest. Uh, it's a massive forest. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the page, that black square that I've outlined is the portion of it that lies in Atlanta County. <laughs> so it's a huge forest. It's, it's lovely with a lot of trails, but that's about it. Um, and even inside of that, there are a couple really good uh, locations. And Becky, did you have, what was the name of that uh, location in there? Pleasant Mills? Um, Pleasant Mills Road was the eBird location, but that trail right there, there's a golden trail and a yellow trail, and those trails are in Atlantic County. But also, we're not saying that you, you know, you're limited to Atlantic County, but we wanted to highlight Atlantic County locations for you. 
but Absolutely. Wharton State Forest is a wonderful resource. Yes. Um, so the importance of Wharton as um, and it, you know, Atlantic County and then into other counties, the importance of it being a large, we've we used this word many times and it's again, still important to use, but a large contiguous uh, forest protected land. And it's a critical habitat for certain species such as the wood thrush, which Becky mentioned earlier, it requires a lot of that contiguous forest during um, its migration season. Uh, broken forest can lead to issues like a window strikes and things like that when it comes in contact with with homes um, and that nesting. it's not used to being. It's and important what, for nesting as well, the nesting the habitat. Large tracts of forest, yeah. Absolutely. So we have a couple of the. Uh, these are Atlant These are some Atlantic County parks. I just wanted to show all the all the Atlantic County parks. We are going to talk about Estelle Manor, um, but there are many other Atlantic County parks, and I just wanted to show that. Yeah, I'm I'm a big uh, big proponent proponent of birding um, kind of small parks. You know, I love some of the small county parks here in um, in Ocean County. And you know, Atlanta County has just uh, just as good parks down there. So, visiting those small sections can be just as good. Um, Estelle, Estelle Manor, it has uh, about 20 miles of trails. Uh, they're not too sandy. It's flat terrain, and it's sometimes pretty wet. Um, the Swamp Boardwalk Trail, which is probably one of the most used trails there, is a 1.8 mile fully accessible elevated trail. Um, it starts right behind the nature center, so you can actually walk that um, all the way out to the Artesian Well, Artesian Well Road. Um, and you can see the ruins of the uh, Bethlehem Loading Company, uh, which was the town built in four months. Uh, there's a really cool story behind it, and um, if you want to know more about that, you should definitely look into it. But you can travel the trails at Estelle Manor and learn all about uh, Belcoville and uh, the Bethlehem Loading Company's um, exploits during the... Uh, early years uh, in the 19, early 1900s. Um, you get amazing views of the South River, which again, great for birding. So a lot of you know, finding different habitats is very important, traveling through different habitats. Um, it's, a, it's a very good thing to have different habitats available to you. Um, so a big river like that, actually being able to go out and view um, a river shore or um, you know, a, a habitat of uh, freshwater marsh or saltwater marsh is, is very good. Um, you have the you know viewing possibilities of bald eagles, uh, other non-birds like otters, uh, red foxes, beavers, and then yellow uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is a, a small woodpecker, and then um, a really pretty plant called the swamp uh, swamp pink. You can find that in the the, mar the the swamps around the boardwalk trail as well. And it may still be in bloom now. I know it's been blooming for a couple of weeks, so yeah. it, it might still be blooming now. I believe it, it probably should be down there. So I hope so. Um, there's That's just a, a view of the boardwalk in Estelle Manor. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. It is raised above the marsh and it's totally flat the whole way. I would just mention that it can be a little slippery, a little slick on wet days. But other than that, it's a wonderful trail to walk on for sure. Um, and there's a lot, like I said, over 20 miles of trails there. So it's got a lot of other options. Um, to, to do for, you know, any kind of day trip. A couple of the, the May warblers, and we're referring to them as May warblers because the month of May is the most likely time that you are to see them or hear them, which again, you're probably more likely to hear them than anything else because they are warblers and they're hard to find sometimes. This is also the eBird list. I copied this from the May eBird list from Estelle Manor. So we've already, um, I've been to, uh, you know, Estelle Manor and a couple other locations we'll talk about um, within the last two to three weeks. And I've seen a nice um, assortment of all the warblers that are in around this time of year. Uh, and I just like to go through a couple really cool warblers that I think, you know, deserve a little appreciation. Um, and you can definitely see at Estelle along with other uh, Atlantic County uh, locations. So one of my favorites, the Prothonotary Warbler. Uh, bright yellow warbler with um, little gray blue kind of wings. Uh, it's insectivorous, so it eats insects. 
Um, it's got a really nice yellow color and then uh, it's got white on its, on its butt, its undertail. Uh, it's, it's all white under there. Um, I love these birds, they're, they're absolutely wonderful. And they live near uh, swamps, near wetlands. So anything to add to that, Becky? No, that's good. Uh, common yellow throat. I'll let you take this one. This one looks like a little bandit with a mask, but this is a great bird. It has a nice, easy song to learn. And it's a common bird of wetland areas. It's just a nice little sprightly bird that we have in, you know, in season. Uh, these are extremely common um, once the season comes around, which is why they're, they're named common yellow throat. They're quite frequent, um, frequently found all over the place. And this photo is actually taken at Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. So uh, they're very common and, and very visible, um, especially when, you know, you drive by and start yelling at the window. These guys come up to check out what's going on. So they're very, uh, very curious little birds. This is an oven bird. Uh, it's a small warbler that it can usually be found on the ground um, and it will uh, pick different food items off of the, uh, the forest floor. Um, obviously it still flies and can fly into the, um, the upper canopies and hang out uh, above and you know on the ground level as well. But it's a little tiny warbler with little uh, pink legs and it walks around and kind of hops around on the ground. It's got a speckly chest. Um, brown back and a really cool looking crown on its head. It's just got like an orange stripe um, and a nice little white eye ring around its its eye. So they're very nice small warblers that are going to be hanging around, um, walking on the ground and hanging out really low. So just to keep in mind a couple of the, you know, as we go through the birds, we're going to be discussing a little bit about uh, what they are, kind of what they do, where they live. And remember that this is all really important, you know, as you are birding, this stuff is really important to know where to look. So if you were looking for an oven bird, um, you might say, look more on the ground or in the lower brush. And if you were looking for a prothonotary, you might be uh, more apt to look a little bit like in the middle of the trees. You wouldn't look totally at the ground. Um, you'd look more so in the middle level of the trees um, and maybe in the low brush as well, because they can still hang out down there. Or if we were looking for something like uh, a blue-winged warbler here, you might be more apt to look a little bit higher in the tree. So, but John, this is- can you flip back to the oven birds for a second? Yes, I can. I just wanted to mention where the oven bird got its name. It actually nests on the ground and it builds a little nest with a cover that, that people have likened to a Dutch oven. That's how it got the name oven bird because of its nest. Which is just a wonderful little fact. <laughs> They're such cool warblers. Uh, again, here's um, a blue-winged warbler. Now, it does look similar to the prothonotary, but what you'll note is that it has a, a black eye strike, which goes from the bill back to uh, about midway on the, the head. It's got a black line on the, the, uh, the face, and its call is uh, very different from the, the prothonotary. But they do both like wetter areas. They do both rely somewhat on wet areas uh, for not only migration, but also for their, uh, their food sources. That's one of the main areas that you can find them hunting for their uh, insect prey. Uh, anything to add for the blue-winged warbler, Becky? Nope, I just think they have a great song. They're the bee buzz, right? That's right. Uh, it, their song, in comparison to other warblers, is a lot less warbly. It's a very strong bee buzz. It's a very buzzy tone to it. It's, it's got a very strong buzz, which is hilarious to hear as you're walking through the, the forest and you're expecting to hear some beautiful warbler song and you just hear this bird that almost sounds like an insect buzzing in your ear. So it's very, as far as warblers go, I, I like these a lot. They have a definite um, interesting song. And one of my uh, favorite warblers that are really hard to photograph is this guy up in the top of a pine tree. And this is at a Lester G. McNamara Wildlife Management Area, also called Tuckahoe. Um, this is a yellow-throated warbler. Um, and if you're looking for these guys, not like the oven bird where you'd be looking on the ground, you will be looking and straining your neck to look at the top of a pine tree to find this bird. They are all the way at the top. Uh, they'll be picking at the, at the cones for insects and underneath the bark um, that's why they like a lot of times will hang out on 
uh, trees that have strong patterned bark so that they can you know, pick up the insects that are gonna be in those crevices. Um, their song is kind of just a very general bird song, very general warble. It doesn't have a lot of uh, interesting craziness to it. It's just kind of a general up and down uh, warble. So um, hearing them can be one of the best ways to locate where they are, but it's hard to learn their song. It's not so um, noticeable all the time because it's just kind of like a very simple couple series of notes. Anything to add, Becky? No. Nope. All right. Uh, so I do like this picture and I, I just wanted to double check with you, Becky, that these are the names of the, um, are these the names of the- The names of the impoundments. The names right. of the actual impoundments. Yeah, inside of Takahoe. Uh, mm -hmm. this, was called, on the, this was on the Wildlife Management Area website, the DEP's website. I did not know this until I saw this picture and I absolutely love it. These are wonderful. Mm -hmm. So they have all the impoundments up the uh, Tuckahoe are all named. Um, and a lot of them have to do with different like birds, like yellow legs. There's two kinds of yellow legs. We have uh, greater and lesser yellow legs, which are little shorebirds. Mallard, which is obviously one of the most common ducks that you'll end up seeing. A uh, willet, which is a wonderful little shorebird that says its name. It says willet, will, willet, willet, will, willet. Um, so it's just a fun little name. And then merganser being a diving, uh, diving duck species. And um, Lester which is named after uh, Lester G. McNamara, who the uh, Wildlife Refuge is named after. Great, Josh, we have a question. Someone yep. asked what an impoundment is. An impoundment is when water is blocked in by land. What they've done is they've built up um, land that you can drive on. So they've blocked in sections of marsh. And the blocked in section is what's called an impoundment. And many times there's water control structures that allow them to control the water that moves in and out of the impoundment. Sometimes they might choose to have it flooded when it's a time that you're going to have waterfowl there, ducks and geese. And other times when it's a time when you might have shorebirds migrating, you want the water level very low and muddy for the shorebirds. So it's nice when you can control the water level in the impoundments. And also here, if you look where the Tuckahoe River is, above the Tuckahoe River is Atlantic County. And then below the Tuckahoe River is Cape May County. Right. So, um... The, a lot of these um, areas, like uh, we talked about a little bit with Wharton, um, and then there's uh, something like Forsyth and uh, Tuckahoe. These areas aren't so small that they are held within like one county or one jurisdiction. Sometimes they're multi-jurisdictional, or, or at least they can span multiple counties where um, different things might have to go uh, be put in place to control different sections. Usually not because you, they're under, a lot of times under, um, especially WMAs, they're federal. So they're under the control of the Department of the Interior, um, uh, which means- sorry, that, sorry to interrupt you there, Josh. The um, WMAs are actually state. The, oh, you were When you were speaking oh, of state. Forsyth, the National <laughs> Wildlife Refuge, that's federal, but the wildlife management areas are state. Yes, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a couple of, like I just, you know, said there, there's a couple of different jurisdictions. There's a state run, there's a federal run, and they all get um, funding from different places um, and have to be run with kind of similar ideas. Actually, uh, let me interrupt you for a second. Actually, speaking of funding from different places, Ducks Unlimited, which is a conservation organization, um, mainly with members that are duck hunters, um, they applied for and got a grant a number of years ago to refurbish Tuckahoe. And they did a major project where they overhauled it. So that was, that was really nice, but that was a nice partnership of Ducks Unlimited and the state and, you know, and the grant that they obtained. So that was a nice partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something to keep in mind is that um, the WMAs uh, the wildlife management areas that are controlled by the state 
Um, a lot of them are, they were paid for by different um, funds, but a lot of them are paid for almost exclusively, um, at least uh, continuing to get new land acquirement and um, controlling them. Um, they're paid for a lot of times by, by hunters. There's actually a big portion of uh, where the money comes from. The land is protected by them in that way. So duck hunting, um, large and small game, it's important. It's an important factor in the protection, you know, in different ways, but it's also an important factor because it allows us to purchase land for protection, which is what we more or less need, you know, especially in a very densely populated state like New Jersey. Josh, let me just jump in for a minute. People not may not be aware of, there's something called the Pittman-Robertson Act. And what it does is it puts a tax on um, things that are um, purchased by hunters, such as ammunition and guns and things like that. But that tax is what pays for things like that. That's where this money comes from, from the hunters. It's a tax on items that they buy. Right. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, is this, this was a map of the, uh, the wildlife management area also showing some of the impoundments, right? This is yeah, this is just a different map. You don't have to focus on it for very long. It's just a different map of the uh, wildlife management area, the same wildlife management area. All right. Um, you want to talk about this one? Sure. This is an area that I've heard wonderful things about. Um, this was acquired in 2019, but you talked about um, lands constantly being acquired. Um, Tuckahoe or Lester G. McNamara Wildlife Management Area acquired this land in 2019. It was a former hunting club, Lenape Farms. And from what I understand, it has 25 miles of trails. So um, it's, a, and I know people that go there and bird watch and absolutely love it. So it's yeah. a nice place to visit. It's right by Estelle, um, Estelle Manor County Park. And looking at this map, Look at all the parks and public land right in that small area that are saved. I think that's fantastic. And it's it's fantastic that it is continuing, even as yeah. you know as late as 2019, and it's still happening. Um, a lot of land is being protected in many ways, and this land is it has so many different um, opportunities on it. You know, but birding being one of those chiefly uh, chiefly notable um, exceptions, just to go out in there. And you can walk for you know miles and find all the species of birds you'd like. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of good places to go birding in here. A lot of good habitat that's been protected. Um, a couple of birds to this was from the uh, the IBBA website. Is that right? Yes. Um, for a couple of birds to be aware of um, that rely heavily on some of these ecosystems. Uh, some would be the eastern wood peewee which is a small flycatcher. Um, literally, the name refers to the fact that it, it eats mostly insects uh, by flycatching, which is the technique it uses to hunt for insects. Um, the gray catbird, which is a really great little bird. It, um, it uses uh, mimic calls, it mimics other birds. So it, uh, it, it sings the same songs as they do, not to attract other birds, to attract other catbirds, but um, it, it doesn't really have its own song. It uses other bird songs and mimics them. And it can learn many, many songs um, to mimic. A couple other birds on the list here were uh, king rail, which is a, a rail species that rely on um, like a marsh areas, so uh, freshwater wetlands. The northern harrier and a bird that hunts over the marsh. Um, and a couple others, the osprey, we'll, we'll touch on a, a little bit later, I believe. And did you want to talk about this a little bit? Not necessarily. I just wanted to show it real quick, just the different habitats that you would find there at the wildlife management area and different birds that you might see in those specific habitats and their status. There are certain birds that are state endangered, like the peregrine falcon, the northern harrier. Um, some species are special concern, regional responsibility species. I just wanted to show it. We don't have to go over it in detail. All right. Um... Ah, and this is my uh, my alma mater. Here it is, uh, Stocking University. I didn't realize what this was when I first looked at the picture because it was at a weird angle, but it's like a drone shot, and now I can see it clearly. Um, but this is uh, Stockton University. It's inside of the Pinelands, the Pine Barrens, um, and it 
is a it's a school dedicated to environmental excellence. It, it really teaches it, because it, we have such a nice outdoor classroom. We can really you know teach students some uh, you know real life skills of being in the pine bin, pine barrens, which is pretty uh, pretty interesting to me. But obviously, I went there. But uh, it's it's a nice habitat overall. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the buildings are maintained in a certain way so that they're also environmentally sensitive um, because they are inside of the Pine Barrens where they kind of have to be uh, treated as such. Um, but on, on campus, you'll find Lake Fred and there's a walking trail around it, which is a very easy walking trail. Um, it's very easy to, to walk on it. It's all level and um, pea gravel. So it's very easy to, uh, to walk on. Um, there's a lot of species that call Lake Fred home. Um, there's a, like here, it is a 1.3 lo mile loop. Um, it's good for, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of people. Um, and nature trips, especially, you know, we did a lot of nature trips around there when I was going to, uh, to Stockton. And here's a nice little list of some of the birds that you might find on campus. Um, so obviously Canada goose, I'm sure we all know what Canada geese look like. Um, wood ducks, mallards, uh, turkeys. We have turkeys on campus. Um, I've seen all kinds of stuff there. So, and Josh, uh, let me just interject there. A couple of times I've mentioned eBird, and that was actually a list from eBird. Anyone can look at eBird, and it's a way to find out um, places where um, places that are considered hot spots in your area where people like to go bird watching and you can also see lists of what people see there. So it's a nice resource and it's just E B I R D and it's something you know that you might enjoy looking up on the computer sometime. Yeah um, it's a really great option for people who want to get involved in citizen science uh, it's it's a fantastic uh, software that you can download on your on your phone as well, so um, it's available you know for for free and it's a really great kind of option for people who want to get out there and actually catalog what birds they see if they want to get better at at um, identification. Um, you can go with people who are you know tour guides and things like that, leaders and um, there's a we'll talk about that in a second too. But there's a couple of walks that we offer in Atlanta County. Uh, for beginning birders or for birders of any level um, to get introduced to, to the concept of birding. And we also use eBird. And um, once you have an account, if you choose to make one, which it is free, um, we can share the list with you and you can start to um, amass a list of your own. So that's also something that I personally love. Uh, I think it's a great option for people to get involved in birding in more than just um, bird watching. Uh, you can really get involved in um, keeping your own your own list for what species you've seen. And uh, this leads right into it. Edwin B. Forsyth, National Wildlife Refuge, uh, controlled by the DOI, the Department of the Interior. Um, it is a massive, massive area of land. Uh, 47,000 acres. Spread across the entirety of the coast of New Jersey. It, it actually spans quite a distance. It goes um, not, all the way north from Bricktown down to about the, you know, Brigantine Atlantic City area. So it, it spans- 44 miles of coastline. And it's uh, anything under Edwin B. Forsyth's um, jurisdiction is protected uh, from, you know, from people building on it and uh, construction and damage to the ecosystem. All these areas are, are have been protected. They're protected from all kinds of, of damage that could be caused. So we'll, we're gonna focus on specifically the unit that is held inside of Atlantic County, um, the unit uh, held um, in Galloway. In Oceanville. In Oceanville. So, uh, but there we go. So Becky, do you wanna talk a little bit about this? This is just, this is the Oceanville Visitor Center. You can just keep on scrolling, Josh. And this is a boardwalk there that uh, you can see Atlantic City in the background. And this is a small boardwalk that goes out over the marsh. You can keep going, yeah. And this is a view of the 
wildlife drive with impoundments on either side. Um, Forsyth has impoundments just like Lester G. McNamara or Tuckahoe has. And you'll have water and marshland on either side of the impoundment as you drive through. Now, this is a good visual representation to show what an impoundment would look like. It, it really is a road that's kind of uh, built um, out of something that was either historically there or was just built. Um, Speaking of historically there, actually there was a railroad that went from Oceanville to Brigantine and it was and the railroad went defunct in 1903. So in the 1950s, when this became a national wildlife refuge, what they did was they used that railroad bed and then for people to drive on and then they expanded on it and made a, a U shaped uh, drive on top of the salt marsh. Absolutely. So you can see the uh, the railroaded. You can no longer see any of the ties or spikes or anything like that from a railroad because they've been uh, long removed. But if you drive up, uh, what is the road that heads right there? Is that a Great Creek Road? Great Creek Road. You can basically travel straight, and you can well, you can't go. You can't go straight into the refuge from there. You have to turn right. But you can look straight ahead, and you'll see right through. It's a straight line. Because that is historically, you know, that's how railroads were built. They were straight lines so you can get places faster. Uh, but you can see straight through and it goes right to um, right to the, the dike on um, Forsyth uh, eight mile driving loop, the eight mile auto loop. A couple really uh, notable birds from the list. Uh, this again is an eBird list that's been posted, which means basically these are birds that people have seen um, it's very good for ducks in the winter and shorebirds uh, in the summer and uh, later summer season. So we have all kinds of different uh, shorebirds that can be seen there. Uh, Wimbrel, Ruddy Turnstone, Dunnelin, all these are different kinds of shorebirds that are very common um, to be feeding inside of the dikes on um, lower tides. Once the mudflats are exposed, you'll find a lot of these shorebirds pecking at the mudflats. So here is um, apparently an extremely liked bird in Atlanta County. Uh, this is the laughing gull. Um, and it is one of the a first gull. It's the first, it's the only gull to come back in the, uh, the summer because the gull that leaves around that time is the ring-billed gull. Uh, and this guy with the black head and um, those black wingtips and the striking color uh, differences, very clean looking hood. Um, the laughing gulls get back here in the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, the spring, and then they'll be here all summer long. They'll breed here. Um, and it's just, it's a phenomenon to watch all these gulls come back because they're not here for about, let's say four to five months, four months, I guess, five months. And then all of a sudden they're back and then they leave. Um, and it's just very, very cool to, uh, to kind of have your finger on the pulse and you can watch this migration occur. Um, and apparently people have noticed uh, that- jo Josh, let me interrupt you. I just want to mention when you say apparently it's a much liked bird, what Josh is referring to is something that I found on a website called iNaturalist. And I, on iNaturalist, if you haven't heard of it before, you can post your wildlife sightings. You can take a photograph and post your sightings on iNaturalist. And it's also a good way to learn. You can go to iNaturalist and put in Atlantic County and birds and look at what birds come up. And it just so happened that the bird that people posted the most uh, was the laughing gull. And I was, I was surprised to see that, that that was the most posted bird on iNaturalist of all the birds. So um, that, was, that was impressive. Do you want to check for questions for a second? Just make sure we don't have any questions. Um, no, I don't think any hands are up, but there's a raise hand button and I haven't seen it. Very good. Pop up. All right. uh, next goal here on the list, because um, I feel like it's important to get to know the fact that these are not just uh, rats with wings, that they really do have a purpose and they're very lovely species. So we referenced the laughing gull. This is a herring gull, um, herring like the fish. Um, these gulls predominantly do eat fish. They don't predominantly eat garbage. 
Um, they really do eat fish uh, in their natural habitat where they do exist out in the, uh, out in the waters of the oceans. Um, and our herring gulls are extremely common gull. We have them here all year round. Um, they're, look at the back of the gull. You'll see that it's light gray. Uh, they're a larger gull. Uh, with a yellow bill. And um, on the bottom of the bill, you'll see that uh, that orange spot. Um, and that is called a uh, gonies patch or a gonidal spot. It goes by a couple different names, but basically it's a soft palate that the chicks peck at and the parent will regurgitate food uh, to feed the babies. So, you know, it, it's, it's more than it seems when, it, you know, you go to the beach and it's covered in these, you know, just gulls everywhere and everyone just calls them seagulls. They're all just seagulls. Well, they're all very, each one of them supports a different type of um, habit, which makes them all uh, kind of special in their own little ways, especially this one right here, which is probably one of my favorite gulls. Uh, as far as gulls go, this thing is really awesome. It's a great black backed gull. It has the largest uh, wingspan of any gull. It's the largest gull in the world. Uh, and we have them right here in New Jersey. They're extremely common. Um, they're semi-pelagic, so you can find them out at sea, but they also will, um, some will remain close to shore, and you'll see them in uh, like seaside communities and things like that. But they're quite large, um, a very dark back, still that yellow bill uh, with that, you'll see they also have the gonies uh, patch, um, but the back is probably the most uh, dramatic thing about them. They're, it's like charcoal or slate gray. It's very dark. Will you flash back to the herring gull so they can see the difference? There you go. Absolutely. So this uh, herring gull, lighter gray back with the still white, uh, you know, most face and chest um, and the flanks and sides and the gray back that kind of spans around. And then this thing with that really slate gray back. So, but that's that's the our gulls. And then another bird uh, to be found at Forsyth is uh, the osprey. Um, now this is a little family of ospreys. You can tell the one in the back with its head raised up kind of yelling at me for taking its photo is uh, the parent. And then the three in the front are all babies. And you can tell that because of the, um, the coloring on the, the wings. It's called scalloping. Um, and it, they have like little white flecks on their brown feathers where an adult, a full adult won't have any of that uh, scalloping. It'll have no, uh, no white wing um, kind of color. It'll just be straight brown. So these are all young. Um, and this bird was, was really, really dramatically um, in decline for a long time because of a chemical called DDT that caused problems with the, uh, the eggs and the egg production of these, these birds. They, they would sit on the eggs and crack them because the eggshells were made too thin because of an inability to coat the egg properly with calcium. That's from eating fish that had eaten mosquitoes that had DDT in them. It's a whole process. And, you know, knowing some of the ecosystem, uh, knowing about some of the problems in the ecosystems is a good way to, uh, you know, just make yourself more knowledgeable about some of the things, why we do certain things in protection of ecosystems and why do we allow certain things to be done. So. Now, Josh, uh, that problem with DDT was in the 1960s and 70s. And in the mid 70s, New Jersey was down to I think it was 50 nesting pairs of ospreys, and now we're well over 500 pairs. So they have rebounded. And another bird that was heavily affected was the uh, the bald eagle, which in the state of New Jersey, and uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Becky, we're, we were down to one nesting pair in the state of New Jersey. I don't know the specifics about the bald eagle, but I know that they also have rebounded. And as far as I know, they were removed from the endangered species list. Yeah because they rebounded so heavily. We, we, we did a lot of management to make it so that we being the federal government and the people in charge of you know, federal protection of species did a lot of um, different things to help bring a lot of these birds that were on the brink back from that devastating brink. Um, and the eagles and ospreys are definitely some of the poster child, uh, poster children for that, that um, uh, effectiveness. All right. Okay, so this is a park I wanted to mention, the little uh, red balloon. It's Egg Harbor Township Nature Reserve. And um, that is right um, by English Creek Road is there and Zion Road. 
and it is right there in the neighborhood and it's a, a really nice place. It's a former uh, quarry and it has been um, redone and they've planted and done a lot of things to refurbish the land and it's a real nice place to visit. And Josh, you can, you can go on. And this tells a little bit about the nature reserve. It's uh, 220 acres. And let's move on to the next site that we have. Oh, this is an eBird listing of the different birds that you see there. And, you know, in May, they saw 70 species, which is great. Yeah, and that's something to uh, definitely be considerate of to, you know, make sure that you, you do realize that there's a lot of species out there. And when you go birding, when you do get out there into the, into the you know, the wilds of New Jersey, uh, don't be, you know, don't be afraid to really um, start to pay attention to all the different kinds of birds that you have and all the different habitats that uh, they live in and all the different habitats that are available to you to walk around in, you know, all these different places that a lot of different county parks and national wildlife refuges and state um, WMAs, wildlife management areas, th these places allow you to visit um, you know, something in New Jersey that we have a lot of, but, you know, there's just, there's so much available to you. So always, uh, you know, always check your local parks, make sure you give some love to your local parks. Um, and, you know, do go to those large places like Edwin B. Forsyth. You go there for a day. You can go to, um, you can go to Smithville prior to, and then go to Edwin B. Forsyth. Smithville, uh, the small um, town, is directly outside of uh, of Edwin B. Forsyth in uh, in um, Oceanville. It's right there, so it's a nice little day trip um, that you can kind of do as a, as a whole a whole little thing. Speaking of Forsyth, Josh, um, you had uh, mentioned before that we have bird walks there every Friday. The refuge offers bird walks from eight to ten. And in uh, April and May, and again in September and October, Atlantic Audubon offers walks from eight in the morning and they go actually a little longer until almost 12. But those walks are free and open to the public and feel free to join in. Now, now this is the North Brigantine natural area. This is a two and a half mile natural beach, a wonderful place to visit. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind right now is that there are some endangered birds that nest there. So from May 15th to September 15th, this area is um, not open to vehicles and not open to pets. It may still be open to people walking, but it is definitely closed to vehicles and pets due to the endangered birds. But this is a lovely place to visit. Yeah, um, and when they, you know, it's really interesting the fact that uh, Brigan, the North Brigantine natural area is located just north of an extremely heavily populated area, and that being Atlantic City. Um, you know, if we can imagine, you know, go back in time to a period of time when Atlantic City really wasn't there, um, think about the natural, go to, go to visit the natural area. It's kind of weird to see what Atlantic City looked like before Atlantic City was there, what that area would have been, which is, um, you know, a huge expanse of natural shoreline. Um, and the fact that it still exists north of Atlantic City, a very densely populated city, and the fact that it is, uh, has maintained its natural state for, you know, such a long time and hasn't been constructed on is, is just lovely. It's, it's very nice to see large swaths of protected area like that protected from things like you know, mass construction, like what we have in some areas where we want to try to limit that in those natural areas that um, a lot of these endangered birds or, you know, endangered species that rely on those areas where they're diminishing those those uh, areas are, um, we're losing them all the time, you know, all the time, just as much as we're also gaining other areas like um, sand pits and turning them into, you know, uh, county parks or township parks or we're losing, you know, areas that used to be protected for other reasons and then being turned into development. So the fact that it exists as a natural area and that you can visit it is, is very, uh, very nice. Um, all right, so here is an image of uh, the, the uh, oh, up here at the 
the north side of it, you can see actual uh, Forsyth, the eight mile driving loop, the auto loop. And then uh, it goes out into a little bay. So all that green is the, is the, is all the green classified as the natural area, Becky? It's, it's salt marsh, but okay. it, mm -hmm. no, go ahead. No, it's salt marsh and it's all, it's all protected land. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's all protected as Forsyth. Yes, but they they have it here. This was the um, the important bird area slide that they showed, and they make it seem like it's part of the North Brigantine Natural Area, but I think it is a lot of it is actually Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. But maybe they're just alluding to the fact that it's all protected land, and it's all still important. So right. very important to a couple a couple different species. Um, and these are some of the birds that you would see there. And, you know, eBird is a nice way to take a peek around and see what kind of birds you might expect to see at different places. What's next, Josh? Uh, North Brigantine's uh, bird list, a couple different birds to be found. Yeah, um, the American oyster catcher is a real nice one. Uh, that's a real, uh, real flashy bird. And these are some of the shore birds that you might expect to see. Um, so let's move along. Aha. Uh -huh. Here is the uh, small protected bird that, uh, you know, needs to be kept safe. Keep in mind that the North Brigantine area is closed to the public um, driving and uh, no pets May 15th to September 15th to protect these birds. This is um, um, a piping clover. It's a, a very small shorebird uh, that a very short bill uh, will probe in the mud for different uh, invertebrates and um, basically nests on the edges of beaches. Um, and I, you know, I, I can tell that there's definitely, you know, a problem with that because beaches tend to be very um, heavily used in the summer months. Well, especially um, Joss, because the chicks don't stay in the nest. As soon as the chicks hatch, they're up and running and following the parents and they have to go down to the edge of the water to probe in the wet sand for invertebrates. And we did have a question actually pop up. Someone was asking about these bird lists. And I had mentioned earlier a website called eBird. It's E-B-I-R-D. And Josh talked a little bit about it as well. But if you go to eBird and look up these different locations, you can see the lists of birds that were seen there. You can see the, bird, the lists of birds that were ever seen there, or you can specify what month you're interested in and look at a specific month and see what was seen in that month. Or you can just see the most recent sightings that people had there. But let's move along. We are getting to the end of our time. And I wanted to mention Birch Grove Park in Northfield. That's a very nice park to visit. Um, you know, just great for birding and nature, real nice place to visit. What's next, Josh? I think that's it. That's it. Okay, so Birch Grove was the last one we wanted to mention. There are lots and lots of um, park and parks and protected land in Atlantic County. So please go out and, you know, make use of your public land. Go in and, you know, explore. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, please do. And thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad that you all came and thanks for having us, Alexis. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I learned a whole lot. Um, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat in the Q&A box or raise your virtual hand and we will unmute you. Um, okay. Here's a question. What is your suggestion for photographing birds? Oh, well, Josh can answer that because those lovely photographs that we saw were Josh's. Oh, wow. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> they were incredible. Um, so do you have a special camera? I do. Um, I use, I'm actually using it right now for my video of, you know, this, this video production as well. So it, um, it's a multi, multitasking camera. It's a, a <laughs> Canon 5D Mark IV, which is on the more expensive realm. You don't have to go that high end. Um, but a lot of times people want to catch like birds in flight and things like that. So you'd need a really high shutter speed, which means in general, you'd need to put a little bit of extra money out for um, 
for your optics for your for your um your camera that you'd like to buy um but yeah birds can be really hard to photograph because unlike plants you know unlike you know scenery birds are moving <laughs> and they're difficult to catch sometimes in um in in action so but, how uh, long does it take you to photograph them? Do you really set up for, for a good chunk of the afternoon or morning? <laughs> I, I utilize my time mostly to actually go birding. And if I happen to find a bird, I'll take a picture of it. I usually don't spend my time trying to photograph. Um, if a bird comes along and I, you know, it's sitting in a pretty sunlight spot and, uh, or I just want a picture of it. You know, sometimes you just see a bird and you're like, wow, I got to get a picture of that. And then, then you do. But uh, yeah, that's, I'm not a professional photographer by any means, but I definitely have a camera and love to go birding, so. Good, good information. Um, and here's another question. Um, how would somebody join your local chapter and are your meetings open to the public or are they for members only? The meetings are open to the public. Our membership is free right now. And you can go on our website, um, AtlanticAudubonSociety.com, or if you like to use Facebook, you can go to our Facebook page. We have an active Facebook page, and there's an online membership form that you can fill out. And again, the membership is free. And right now we're having virtual meetings, but probably in the summer we will have social distanced meetings at our local park. We normally meet at the Galloway Library on Jimmy Leeds Road, and there's a little park right there. And we've had a few meetings uh, right in the little pavilion and, and around it. So I'm sure we'll be doing that again. So just keep an eye on our website or check our Facebook page. But we'd be glad to have um, you know more people join us. That'd be great. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. OK, last call for questions. If anybody has a question, please type it in the chat or raise your hands. Um, again, this was really great. Thank you so much for your time tonight, both of you. You're welcome. We're glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here. Okay. And what's your favorite birding spot of all time in South Jersey? Outside <laughs> of Atlanta County. <laughs> all right. Thanks for having us. Good night. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.